What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Whether you're joining us on the podcast and you cannot see me, you can only hear me, or you're looking at me via YouTube, thank you for joining. Your man's Nicholas, big dogs, gotta eat fantasy football. Since it's Wednesday, we are continuing my breakout column. Today, we are doing my top three breakouts at the tight end position for 2018 fantasy football. We've already done my top three running back breakouts, my top three wide receiver breakouts in the previous two weeks. So if you've missed either of those, I will link them down below or you can go search my channel if you'd like. Before we start, I want you to comment down below. If you could pick one person, one tight end to break out this year that hasn't really broken out yet, I guess anyone being picked after like top 10 tight end rankings, who would it be for 2018 fantasy football? Pretty sure we'll probably see the same like two or three names. Probably a lot of Trey Burton. Probably a lot of David and Joku. I want you to leave a comment down below who would be your number one breakout for this year. Uh, while you're down there, please give the video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed or if I've given you value thus far. If you're new to the channel, welcome. And I want to get right into this thing. Hit you with the numbers, statistics, the fire. We're in the grit. We're ready to roll. Let's get cracking. The reason this video is very important to you guys is because if you're not going with an early tight end, if you're not getting one of the top guys, the tight end position is very, very difficult to stream in fantasy football because if, if you're not getting one of the guys who produces consistently, you're kind of screwed. There's a lot of guys who are going to give you floors of like 20 to 30 yards a game. So if you can hit on a breakout candidate, a guy who's being drafted super low but ends up having a monster year, that could, that could be a make or break for your team. So we're going to start off with my number one breakout candidate in 2018 fantasy football. That's my man's Georgie Kittle out in San Francisco for the 49ers, currently being picked 113th overall as tight end 12. Now, he's going to be a very, very popular breakout candidate. He was pretty much one of my first, I think, Stay Woke Saturdays on my Instagram that I do. I put out a sleeper every Saturday on Instagram. So if you're not following me there, I would I would suggest doing so. And he was one of my first ones when they when I first started doing my research back in like March or whatever it was. So I've been on the George Kittle hype train for a minute. Now the uh, 49ers front office obviously likes George Kittle a lot because the prior regime, you know, signed Vance McDonald to a five-year, thirty-six million dollar uh, deal extension and then they got rid of him in favor of George Kittle who's likely to take over as the starting tight end in this new Jimmy Garoppolo Kyle Shanahan led offense in San Francisco and we saw this connection start to pay dividends down the stretch particularly in the last five games of the season when Jimmy Garoppolo took over as the starter for San Francisco from weeks 13 through 17 the last five weeks of the regular season last year Kittle was a top 10 fantasy tight end ranking third in fantasy points per snap over that five-week span. If you get even more granular, he was a top three fantasy tight end over the final three weeks of the season. Wrapping up with stat lines, these, these are three game logs right here. Four for 52, three for 42 in a touchdown, and then four for 100 in their last game. Now, if you take a look at his just overall measurables and metrics via player profiler, you're seeing a kid who's young, 24 years old, he might have just turned 25, I'm not sure, but good size, 6'4", 250-ish, which is around, you know, Jordan Reed, a little bit bigger than Jordan Reed, but still plenty of um, size and speed to really uh, move around and be a, a receiving tight end, which is what you need in today's kind of NFL, right? And Kittle was just a combine stud. Like I said, good size. He ran a 4'5", 240-yard dash, which is super fast for a fantasy tight end. Puts him in the 96th percentile for weight-adjusted speed score. And, you know, as you can see, just the numbers and the metrics jump off the screen. Every part of this, he's ranked very highly. 89th percentile spark score. Now, he finished with 515 receiving yards, 43 catches on the year, which was second most among all rookie tight ends last year. The only guy who beat him was Evan Ingram. It's very hard to produce as a... Last year was his rookie season, for those of you guys that are unaware. Very hard to produce as a rookie tight end in the NFL in terms of statistics for fantasy football. He only scored twice. Right, So his two tutties were not exactly what you want to see from a fantasy owner perspective, but he got 16 red zone targets and 7 10 zone targets. So 7 targets inside the 10 yard line, which is definitely encouraging to see considering that he wasn't even really a full-time player last year. Right, They had Garrett Selleck who actually um, was pretty heavily involved when Jimmy Garoppolo was in the offense as well. Either way though, there's 
much more opportunity for Kittle in 20, uh, 2018 to get more playing time and overall more snaps. So the 16 red zone targets, 7 10 zone targets are definitely a positive in my eyes because if he's going to be utilized down there, they don't have many scoring threats, right? You look at the, the weapons they have on that offense. So they have Marquise Goodwin, who is a field stretcher. He's a good receiver, but a field stretcher. You have Pierre Garçon, who's old, coming off a serious injury. Never a red zone, never a goal line threat, right? He always He's scoring like four or five touchdowns. And then they have the rookie, Dante Pettis, who's going to be playing a lot of special teams, but definitely not like a goal line specialist. So who is Jimmy G going to be looking down to in that area of the field? He's going to be looking at a guy like George Kittle, who's easily the biggest target in that area of the field. So I really like that. If we dig a little deeper, if we look at more statistics in, in um, for last season when it comes to Kittle, there were 30 tight ends in 2017 that had at least 40 targets. It's basically almost like one per team, right? So you're looking at all the starting tight ends that had at least 40 targets. Among those 30, Kittle ranked 4th in yards after catch, 7th in yards per target, and 12th in yards per reception. So he's an explosive athlete, right? He's someone who catches the ball well but can make plays after the catch, which is what I love because when you have tight ends that you need to rely on their touchdown upside, touchdowns are very volatile year over year. So when you have a guy like Kittle who's super athletic, ranks fourth in yards after catch, and can make plays with the ball in his hands, that's uh, that's something that I look for when I'm looking at breakout um, tight end candidates because if, if you're not going to be able to predict the touchdowns, you have to be able to look at something like yards or receptions that are um, that are reliable year over year. And that's what I think we see with a guy like George Kittle. And um, what else do we got here? So the one thing I would say is I brought up Garrett Selleck before. And I think no one, I don't think anyone else has even touched on this, but Selleck was really um, pretty heavily utilized in the games when Jimmy G was the quarterback. He actually outsnapped George Kittle in the first three games that Jimmy G was quarterback. Um, and he put up two really good games. I forget what the statistics were. I think he went two for 63 in a touchdown and then like three for 65 in a touchdown. Um, and then he got hurt. And that's when George Kittle kind of opened up and, and kind of had his little breakout. But it's it's kind of, I think it's just something I should note as kind of like a, you know, I like to play the devil's advocate on my channel a little bit and let you guys um, get all the information and then make your decisions that way. Uh, but Selleck was involved. So it's it's something worth noting because we don't know if he's going to still see a snap share, um, you know, overall as the starting tight end or like what's going to happen there. But I, uh, Kittle's ceiling is much, much higher, right? As a rookie, performed very well. And uh, if he takes any kind of step forward, he's going to be looking at a very, very big year, you know, with Jimmy uh, Garoppolo coming into his second year as a full time starter. This offense, the sky is like the limit, especially with Kyle Shanahan. It just, uh, it, they have a chance to explode here in 2018. So George Kittle, my number one breakout candidate for tight ends. Before we get into the next one, guys, uh, my draft guide, the official 2018 Big Dog's Gotta Eat Fantasy Football draft guide comes out and officially one, two, three, four, five. It's probably gonna launch July 9th. So I'm gonna go five days. I was gonna say July 8th or July 9th. I'm not sure which day it's exactly gonna be ready, but either July 8th or July 9th. So we're talking about five days. It is available on the site right now. You can you can go purchase it before it comes out. And uh, it has everything. So if you like my analysis, you are going to absolutely love this guide. It's completely interactive, completely on their phone, laptop, um, tablet, whatever you use for your draft, it's going to be downloadable in PDF version as well if you want to cross out the rankings. It's got my top 250 overall rankings. It's got all my positional rankings, which are broken down by tier, my top busts, my top sleepers, my must draft guys, um, as well as like a bunch of exclusive articles and videos and um, sections that you will not see outside of the draft guide. A lot of cool stuff is in there, guys. Worked very hard on it. I think it's going to give you a ton of value for the price that you're having that you have to pay for it. So if you want to check out the draft guide, I highly appreciate you do that. I'll link my site right here. You'll see it on the front page as well as down below. So grab the draft guide. It's going to be updated throughout the summer weekly. I'm going to update a bunch of different sections. So I'm always going to be on top of things with the draft guide. You will not be disappointed. I promise you that. So go check that out. Uh, before we move on to tight end number two. And if you're enjoying the video so far, guys, I would really, really appreciate if you would hit the thumbs up button because that lets YouTube know that I did a good job, that I worked hard, and that you guys are liking my video so other people can find me and big dogs can go motherfucking global, baby. We're getting on to number two, which is my man Ricky Seals-Jones of the Arizona Cardinals, currently going 173rd overall tight end Number 23, a lot to discuss here. I'm just gonna call him RSJ for simple, simplifying purposes. It, it, he was kind of like the Will Fuller 
of tight ends last year in 2017. He was like the Will Fuller of tight ends because he did so much with such a small opportunity. And he was an undrafted free agent who played wide receiver in college, was converted to a tight end when he came into the pros. Super intriguing in terms of uh, an athlete, in terms of being a prospect at the tight end position. A 4.69 40 yard dash, which is very good for a tight end. 6'5, 245, so also good, a great blend of size and speed, like we kind of discussed with George Kittle. And, uh, you know, he's going to ride his freshman season into his sophomore season. And I think there's tons of potential for a breakout here. We look back at last year. He ran just 70 routes. RSA ran 70 routes in 2017. He managed to catch 12 passes for 201 yards and three touchdowns, averaging 16.8 yards per reception. That is a huge number for a tight end that tells you that he has a lot of explosion in him. Um, but then again, it was only 12 catches, so... Very small sample size, but the flashes were absolutely there. There was a three-game run, which really kind of put him on the map from weeks 11 to 13, where he went three for 54 and two touchdowns, four for 72 and touchdowns, and for four for 72 and one touchdown, and then two for 44. So big plays, a lot of scoring in a small time frame. Uh, and then he kind of disappeared, fell off the face of the earth. I'm not going to, you know, admittedly, I will, uh, I'll say that, and Seals Jones kind of disappeared, but I still think he has plenty of breakout potential in 2018. His production on such limited routes earned him the number one spot on Pro Football Focus's points, fantasy points per opportunity in both standard and PPR. He outpaced every single NFL tight end. Because he was used so limited last year and produced at such a high level, he ranked number one in fantasy points per opportunity. He also graded out as PFF's number nine overall receiving tight end. Um, so he wasn't just like, you know, made some flashy big plays. He was overall a very good receiving tight end as per PFF. And speaking, speaking of PFF, uh, if you want to enter into a contest, a free year subscription paid by me for the Pro Football Focus Edge Package, which has all their player grades, their wide receiver cornerback matchups, all that kind of stuff. Um, do yourself, on, uh, do yourself a favor, go follow your mans on Twitter and on IG. Go leave a rating and review on the podcast, which is linked down below, which is BDGE Fantasy Foosball. Um, and yeah, just do those two. Follow me on those, leave a rating and review, and you will be entered um, for the Pro Football Focus Edge Package. Now, as I was saying before, it's very hard to produce as a rookie, especially as a tight end, and especially in a limited role, which is exactly what RJ found himself in in 2017. And it was mainly because they had Jermaine Gresham, who was a veteran tight end there um, in Arizona. As, you know, he was the starter for most of the year. Then Gresham tore his Achilles in week 17. And that's like the big piece of this puzzle here is why RSA will be a popular breakout pick in uh, in 2017, or 2018, I should say, excuse me. And RSA is just 23 years old. And this job is pretty much locked up to be his. Um, and all of the reports out of Cardinals camp, including the Cardinals reporter Mike Jurecki, you know, he's going to play an expanded role, and his role is going to be increased this year. So it's not just like a one-off thing. Like, the people that are watching these practices and the people at the minicamp are saying they expect him to be a much bigger part of this offense, which is good. You always like to hear those kind of things. Now, the other two things to consider when we're talking about RSJ is the quarterback position and the coaching changes here. They drafted Josh Rosen with their first-round pick, right? Number 11 overall. I think it was 11. Was it 10 or 11? I think it was 11 overall. who will likely start the season behind Sam Bradford. Um, I do expect him to get in eventually. Well, maybe, you know, as long as Sam Bradford can stay on the field, Rosen might be behind him for his entire rookie year. But either way, you look at Bradford, who's a guy who's made his living throwing uh, short and intermediate passes at a very high, accurate percentage, if I said that correctly. I feel like I stay be messing up, like, the English language when I talk on these videos. But this is where RSA is going to operate, right? And Larry Fitz can't get all of all the targets. I mean, I mean, certainly can try, but RSA I think is in line to get a uh, significant increase in volume. Here's a crazy stat that I found. Right, Bradford has been in the NFL since 2010. That was his rookie season. In his eight seasons that he's played in the NFL, he's only had four seasons in which he's played. He started in more than 10 games, so 11 or more games. He's had four seasons of that. I looked back in those four seasons, and I wanted to see how the tight end produced. Because like I said, Bradford is a guy who focuses on those short intermediate routes, which is where tight ends run. So I looked at over those four seasons in which he's played more than 10 games, he started more than 10 games, the average, the tight end position in those offenses averaged 116 targets, 81 catches, 889 yards, and six touchdowns. 
And the two most recent seasons were Minnesota in 2016, uh, where Kyle Rudolph finished as tight end two. He had that career year, caught 83 passes for 840 yards, seven touchdowns. And the year prior, uh, in 2015, with Philadelphia, Zach Ertz caught 75 balls for 853 yards. Now, those averages, the uh, 116 targets, 81 catches, 889 yards, six touchdowns, were the combined tight end position, not just their starter. But with Jermaine Gresham out, they really don't have anything at tight end there in Arizona, and a lot of that production should come by way of Ricky Seals-Jones. Now, like I said, the other, the other change is in the coaching staff. They bring on the former Panthers defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes um, and Mike McCoy. Now, uh, it's hard to say what you're going to get out of this because as Wilkes is a defensive-minded coach, I'm not going to say that he was, um, you know, he was with the Panthers for a while, but you, you can't put any of Greg Olson's production like on Wilkes because the defensive coordinator. Um, what you can look at is Mike McCoy, and he was the head coach for the Chargers from 2013 to 2016. Never had a tight end finish worse than tight end 12 in fantasy. Um, he was with the Broncos last year, but got let go after like a six-game slide. I think it was. They didn't have really any tight end production there, but they didn't really have anyone healthy, and they had horrible quarterback play, so I'm not really going to hold that against them. Um, but we did see him produce well with Antonio Gates from 2013 to 2016, so I think that is good. He knows at least how to use the tight end, if nothing else. Um, I don't know. I just think that they're ready to make Ricky Seals-Jones a big part of this offense, an offense that desperately needs playmakers outside of Fitz and outside of David Johnson. They have a bunch of unprovens, whether it's Christian Kirk, whether it's Bryce Butler, whether it's J.J. Nelson, Chad Williams, right? None of these guys are proven. None of these guys are um, secure as the number three target in this offense. I think Ricky Seals-Jones has a very good shot of locking that up and being a, uh, a legitimate red zone threat. So Ricky Seals-Jones definitely on his way to a breakout in 2018. So the third and final breakout candidate at the tight end position this year is going to be announced right after we thank our sponsors for this video, fantasyjocks.com, linked in the description down below. Thank you for sponsoring the video. Fantasyjocks.com is the GOAT fantasy sports go-to for your league's needs. Baseball, football, basketball, it doesn't matter. They provide championship belts, championship rings, championship trophies all this cool stuff as long as some miscellaneous stuff too they got a cool section on that some coffee mugs t-shirts some swag like that they do live draft boards if you guys do a live draft at your house with your boys but these things are awesome man it, it gives you something to play for alongside the the money that you probably do a buy-in for with your leagues and stuff like that very very high quality stuff man i would not sell this stuff to you if i didn't think it was high quality this is the belt i use for my big money league i still haven't given it to the winner i've been saying that for months now i don't think i'm ever going to i'm just gonna pretend i've been uh, i want on the chip but you can get your league's winners engraved on the side of the belt or the trophy or whatever you end up purchasing my thing is just have everyone chip in an extra five seven twelve bucks depending on how big your league is and get yourself one of these and you'll have it forever and you can pass it around and you can wear it when you're watching football with your boys you guys go to b double dubs buffalo wild wings tell me you don't want to walk in there with this thing bruh i'll be like save some pussy for the rest of us but no serious no go check out fantasyjocks.com very cool even if you want to just browse a little bit then go back and and, and talk to your boys and and tell them what you found on the site it's all good stuff i highly recommend getting one of these things to play for makes your league that much more exciting but fantasyjocks.com link down below thank you for sponsoring today's video number three breakout tight end for the 2018 fantasy football season vance mcdonald pittsburgh steelers currently being picked around 160 overall tight end 21 so actually ahead of ricky seals jones this is more of a dart throw he is based like the way I would see Vance McDonald is he he's kind of, I mean, he's not old, I wouldn't say, because we see a lot of breakout tight ends later in their career, but he's like 28 years old. He's someone like, um, if he can stay healthy, I could totally see him having like a Gary, Gary Barnage type of year, where I'm not like super high on Vance McDonald to develop into an elite tight end in the NFL, but if there's someone who's going to break out at a later age this year, it's going to be Vance McDonald. That's, that's what I think. So... You look at his me measurables and metrics, uh, and, and a very good athlete again, right? Most of the guys that end up on these kind of lists, the, the tight ends that kind of break out, are usually of the better percentile when it comes to athletes. Now, he's a 93rd percentile spark athlete, and he's flashed at times, but he cannot stay healthy, and he hasn't been able to put a full season together, right? 2018 will actually be his sixth year in the NFL. Um, and like I said, he's turning 28 years old, or he just turned 28 years old. Now, again, I'm not worried about the age because tight ends 
tend to, a lot of tight ends tend to break out later because it takes them a while to develop. Tight ends a tough position in the NFL to develop because you have to learn all the blocking schemes as well as be a good receiver if you really want to have um, that type of breakout. And we've seen other guys besides Gary Barnes, like Ben Watson and even Kyle Rudolph was 27 during his breakout uh, 2016 career year. So there's plenty of examples of people breaking out at this age or later. Um, Basically, what happened with Vance McDonald, in 2016, he signed a five-year, $36, $35 million extension with San Francisco that I was talking about with George Kittle before um, back in December of 2016. Literally one day after that, he landed on the IR with a shoulder injury, and that was basically his end of uh, his tenure in in the Bay in San Francisco. Once a new regime came in, you know, uh, led by GM John Lynch. The team wanted nothing more to do with Vance McDonald. I just don't think they liked the whole injury history and and whatever was going on with McDonald. So they moved him to Pittsburgh, where uh, where they really haven't had even a resemblance of a playmaker at the tight end position since Heath Miller retired in 2015. Vance's only true competition in yellow is the brutally average Jesse James. Um who we saw take a backseat to Vance McDonald as the year went on, especially in the playoffs. In the playoff loss to Jacksonville that Pittsburgh had last year, Vance McDonald caught 10 of 16 targets for 112 yards. So a lot of people are going to look back at the stats and not see a huge uh, spike in McDonald's numbers last year because the playoffs aren't usually included in, in, in stats of the previous season. How many tight ends do you know in the NFL that would ever command a 16-target workload? Um, not many. I could. I don't know how many targets have ever. How many tight ends in the history of the NFL have had a 16-target game, let alone Vance McDonald. So that tells you something. That tells you uh, what Ben. That Ben's. At, at, if nothing else, there's a lot of upside with Vance McDonald there. So that's a monster ceiling. Um, and despite you know limited time and nagging injuries last year, McDonald ranked inside the position's top 11 in yards per reception, yards per target, and yards after catch last year. So efficient as well on the small volume. Now, I know this is kind of nitpicking, but I think it's worth mentioning. Mentioning, As I mentioned Heath Miller before, I want to talk about his kind of involvement in Pittsburgh and you know the numbers that he put up as a tight end. Obviously, he's a very, very good tight end. He proved that he was consistent for a long period of time and one of the better tight ends over his tenure in, um, in yellow. But um, he played in the league from 2005 to 2015, and I wanted to take away 05 and 06 because that's his rookie sophomore year. And like, like I said, most, most tight ends don't tend to produce much in their in their first two seasons. So I wanted to give a more realistic picture of what Heath Miller really was as a player. So I took away the first two years. And his per season numbers, Heath Miller's per season numbers, while Ben was in the lineup, so the splits here, 89 targets, 65 receptions, 712 receiving yards, and five touchdowns. That would give you a top 10 tight end in any given fantasy season. 712 yards and 65 catches, five touchdowns. So... Um, if McDonald can lock up that tight end one role there and gain some trust with Big Ben, which we saw in the playoff game last year, I think that he can certainly have like a 600-yard, 55-60 to 60 catch season here, even with all, all the weapons there, man. This is a very, very high-scoring offense that passes the ball a ton. Their pass attempts are always within the top 10, top 5 um, for Big Ben and, and just overall for the, for the offense. So I think there's a lot of volume to go around, although there are a lot of weapons. So I like Vance McDonald's ceiling a lot. Now, he's yet to play a full 16-game season, and he's averages 9.2 appearances a year uh, throughout his six-year or five-year. Was it? Yeah, he's played in five years. This will be his sixth year. So it's five years. He's averages 9.2 games a season. So the injury concern is very real. But so is the upside, man. If he can put it together and stay on the field, like I said, I really think I see some kind of Gary Barnage type season at an older age from him. Now, this is a player to monitor throughout camp. Um, and see if there even is a position battle between him and Jesse James or if they're just going to hand it over to McDonald. But as the word about him so far um, from ESPN's Jeremy Fowler of Pittsburgh believes tight end Vance McDonald will be a big part of the Steelers' offense. So those are the things we'd like to hear, and I, I like um, I, I like Vance McDonald as a breakout candidate this year. Now, I did not list. Here's my honorable mentions. We have Trey Burton, O.J. Howard, David and Joku. I didn't list e- any three of those guys as my breakout candidates. And uh, the reason for that is, I think the hype for them, in order for me to consider them a breakout candidate, I think they need to exceed the hype in which they're going to the season with. Trey Burton's hype is pretty high already. 
But again, there are a lot of what in all three of these offenses, there are a lot of mouths to feed. Trey Burton, I, I think he will be probably the third most targeted, actually maybe even the fourth most targeted player in that offense behind Robinson, Anthony Miller, possibly Tariq Cohen, depending on how heavily they utilize him. I think Trey Burton might have similar statistics to to Vance McDonald because I think Trey Burton is not going to score a lot of touchdowns. I think that Mitch Trubisky is probably I don't see Mitch Trubisky being like a, you know like a top ten touchdown passer kind of guy. I, I see him maybe finishing with 20 touchdowns in a good year, 22 maybe. And in order for Trey Burton to have a breakout year, he's going to command. He's going to need to command like 30 percent of those touchdowns, right, and score seven touchdowns. So I don't think it's reasonable. I think like four to five touchdowns is, is a fair projection for him. And if you're not scoring more than four to five touchdowns, right, that's still like what I said, basically like 20 to 22 percent of Trubisky's overall passing touchdowns. Probably not going to have a breakout year. So, I mean, I like Trey, Trey Burton. He has a nice floor, but I don't think his ceiling is necessarily as high as people are making it out to be. O.J. Howard, if I had to pick one of these three guys to absolutely explode this year, it would be O.J. Howard. I believe in him as a prospect. And uh, he, in all efficiency metrics, metrics, efficiency metrics last year, he produced very well. Thing is, they re-signed Cameron Braid again, right? So he's going to take a lot of touchdowns. Of course, they're going to be without Jameis Winston for three games. And then they have, you know, Chris Godwin ascending. They already have Deshaun Jackson, Mike Evans. They got a lot of a lot of players already. So it's hard to see Njoku, you know, see more than like a 14% target share in that offense. Same thing with Njoku. It's too many weapons there for him to really break out. All of these guys' ceilings are very limited by the role that they're playing in this offense. I know you could probably say that with Vance McDonald as well. But like I said, he's more of a dart throw than anything else. Um, I would not be uh, picking him as like a starter. The only guy who I'd be comfortable with probably as my starter in this um, out of this whole entire group would probably be George Kittle. And I'm, I'm kind of even hesitant on that, to be honest with you. I just I love his upside, but I would, if I'm taking George Kittle, then I would probably also grab another tight end. Maybe two of these guys on the same roster, which would be fine, because one of them will probably hit. But, um, but yeah, and in terms of Njoku, right, they have all the weapons there. So it's so hard to see him get more of a share and he didn't have like a full he wasn't like the full-time tight end starting there in Cleveland in, in Cleveland last year and the thing about that is it was because Seth Devolve which is, who is another tight end is very talented and people are underrate, underrating him and underestimating him and uh, I don't think he's going away I think he's still going to be like a decent um, player in this offense or at least get decent snaps so I'm not sure that we see Njoku bump up to a full like 80%, 90% snap guy this year just because people want him to be. Seth Duvall was very good last year, probably will still remain a part of this offense, and I, I, just, I don't know. I just don't see the ceiling on these three guys like Burton, Njoku, and O.J. Howard. If I had to pick one, it'd be O.J. Howard. Um, and that's really going to wrap it up for today's top three breakout candidates at tight end. We had George Kittle, we had um, Ricky Seals-Jones, and we had... Vance McDonald, all three very good athletes, all three primed to finally take over as a starting tight end in their respective offenses. So that's it for today. Um, we'll be back Friday with a new mock draft, Sunday live streams. As always, make sure you got notifications on below. Um, hit that little bell underneath the video so you'll get a not notification when I go on live. I just do like Q&A and bullshit with people on the live stream, which is a lot of fun. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. That is monumental subscribe to the channel if you are new um, and i appreciate you sticking around for this long make sure you go cop the draft guide which is coming out in five days all right i'll see y'all friday peace